Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. There's lots of water that flows from your rooftop and your driveways. How about directing the flow of the water into a rain garden? Also, correct mowing will help your lawn look its best. That's just ahead on the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Celeste Scott. Celeste is a UT Extension agent in Madison County, and Booker T. Lee will be joining me later. All right, Celeste, it's good to have you here Thanks today. For having, thanks for y'all for coming yeah, here. Cool. So we are here at UT Gardens Jackson, mm -hmm. just kind of going all around the grounds, and we are standing at our rain garden cool. demonstration okay. area. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, right. rain gardens are, they can be beautiful, but they are also <laughs> functional okay. and have a real purpose. So okay. as we can see here, uh, rain gardens are depressed planting areas. Mm -hmm. So when we're getting ready to actually create one, we need to, you're going to need to do some excavation on the front end. Okay. So First one thing we want to stay away from is establishing rain gardens in areas that already hold water. Ah, that's right? Good point. So that that's good would point. be called a bog garden. Okay. okay yes. A bog. Yeah. All right. Rain gardens' uh, utility purpose is to catch rainwater and help infiltrate it into the soil profile. Okay. So I feel like this is perfectly situated. Um, I don't know if the viewers can see, but there's a home over mm -hmm. here on this side, and we have gutters, obviously, that are directed towards uh, towards this rain garden. Okay. There's also this area of impervious surface. We've mm -hmm. got a, the paved driveway area. We've got sidewalks. So when we planned this garden, we used all of this in our calculations to determine the size of the garden and the depth of the garden okay. that we would need to catch the rainfall that would come from an average rain event. And here in Tennessee, that's about a half of an inch is our average okay. uh, rain event. So that's what we based our measurements off of. Another thing that right. we wanna uh, check before we s actually start constructing a rain garden is infiltration of the existing soil. Good. So you wanna do a percolation test. Okay, so what do we mean by a perk test? Okay, so it's super important that we understand what rate of infiltration our soils okay. are going to be able to tolerate Good. because that's the purpose of a rain garden sure, sure. to catch Good. and infiltrate water recharge that groundwater okay so we're going to dig a hole that's 12 inches deep right. the hole needs to have straight sides we don't want it straight tapered sides. okay so make sure we have straight okay. sides you fill it up with water and allow it to completely drain that's what we call we're charging it okay. essentially um, we're just saturating the, the soil in that area. Then you come back and fill it up a second time. So you fill it up again? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and then you measure how long it takes for the water to drain out of that hole. Okay. Got and it. in those documents we're going to post on the site, you'll there'll be a chart there. Um, okay, if good. it's in within this range of inches per hour, you're at a slow rate. Okay. This one is a medium. This range is high rate. Okay. And you want to aim for medium and high rates of infiltration. If you fall into the low range of infiltration, we need to look for a different site for wow. our rain garden okay. or it's or? going yeah, or, or? It's going to require some amendments. Uh, okay. We're going to have to do some some things to drill down through possibly hard pans. Oh, wow. We're going to need to incorporate uh, some some organic materials, okay. sand possibly to help uh, lighten that soil structure and help with infiltration. Got it. So okay. that's the number one priority when we're picking our spot is making sure that we're going to be able to let that water move down the way it should. Okay, so you got to do a perk test. Okay. Yes. So then once we have all these numbers together, we have the square footage of the impervious surfaces, okay. the roof, Oof that's feeding the rain garden, the sidewalks, also a uh, sheet flow of the lawn, okay. right? Coming directly into the rain garden could be a factor. Once we have those areas and our infiltration rate um, determined, then we can bring all that together to figure out the dimensions of our rain garden and what is actually going to be um, most useful in that particularly residential area. Okay. So that's what we've done here. And this garden is about 10 years old. Okay. 
it's gone through a few facelifts. <laughs> <laughs> so our planting plan is not the same as it was when sure. we first came in. But what we do like to encourage folks is to plant in swaths. So it's a little more visually appealing if you have several, like say three or four of a type of plant okay. instead of one of this and one of that. So let me ask you this. So the plant material has to be able to withstand some water, right? Yes. So some wet feet. Good point. Okay. So there on that that uh, distinction between a ball garden and a rain okay. garden. So these plants can tolerate submersion okay. um, up to t up to 48 hours of submersion in the deepest zone. Got it. So some of these plants would be things that you would find naturally growing in swampy type kind of areas. Okay. Makes sense. And then as we work our way yeah. up, okay. obviously we get higher and higher. So then we've got a mid zone. Got it. Those plants are supposed to be able to tolerate about 24 hours of submersion. And then once you get into your upper zone here at the very top, that's basically, it's really close to just your regular average garden site. Okay. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Good stuff. So the closer That's you good. get to the edge, the more uh, you know common type plants that you might would plant. Things you would find like in your perennial borders. Okay. So we've tried to plant everything in okay. here with native species. Now that is not a requirement okay. for a rain garden. You do not have to stay strictly um, native, but that's just an angle that we wanted to take um, for this particular garden. And we have plenty of resources out there. Sure. Um, plant lists. Um, we've got uh, publications that are going to help you do all those calculations to figure out the size and dimensions of your rain okay. garden. So definitely check out uthort.com. Uthort.com. And we'll try to have those publications on our website. Excellent. Yes. Good, good, good. So all these things are going to be available for people to use. Yes. Um, I'm trying to think what... Maybe what else should we talk about? You want to highlight a couple plants? Yeah, let's talk about a couple of these plants okay. here, especially this one right here, right? Yes, yes. So this is a fun little plant. This particular cultivar I think is called Sugar Shack. So it's a little <laughs> smaller than the typical one, but it's a button bush okay. is a common mm -hmm. name, what folks might be familiar with. You can tell we've just passed our season of bloom yeah. there. Um, they have the cutest little white puff I ball like uh, blooms that cover it. So this is a really cool plant and it's one of those that can tolerate some of the longest submersion. You'll see it's it. planted way down here deep okay. in uh, the concave of the garden. This yeah, is, what is this massive plant? Yeah, right? this is pretty unique. This um, is a willow leaf spice bush okay. and um, so we know that this is a host plant to our swallowtails, oh, yeah. right? So we're doing some things there for our pollinators um, and uh, native ecosystems right there but it's kind of growing wild on us it could probably use a little pruning to it's get it huge. back into check um also this right here to my right this is a plant that i love it's mm -hmm. called baptisia this is one of the um, straight species so it's not you know a named cultivar it's not doesn't have super flashy blooms okay. it does have blooms in the summertime but they're i mean in the early spring but they're nestled, you know, more down into the okay. foliage. They don't stand up on top like some of the newer cultivars do. And tell us about the pods. Yes, so these are really cool. You can see, you can see here, oh, nice. um, the seed pods, and they kind of shake. They have the seeds on the inside, and so you can shake those. Kids actually, back in the day, would use those as neat little, fun little toys. Pop them open, got oh, a whole got bunch of seeds, seeds in there. In there. Yeah. They'll grow easily from seed. That's actually how this little grove spread itself around. Okay. We started with one plant and it's just progressed. Yeah, it's here's, here's a new one coming yeah. on right there in the front. So Baptisia is a great pla uh, plant for rain gardens. Okay. This, this monstrosity right here, <laughs> this is ironweed. So you might, a lot of people, you know, think this is a weed. Well, I mean, it's got weed well, in the name. Yeah, yeah. so weed all depends on where it's planted and what you want to use sure. it for. But it loves the moisture. It towers above us. It has tall. purple blooms later in the summer. So that's a fun plant. Okay. And we're sitting here looking at the rain garden now. We had not had rain in a long oh. time. It's been hot and dry, but you can see the plants are still surviving. Though. Oh yeah, they're gorgeous. See? So the, the main differentiation between rain gardens and ball gardens is that these plants, while they do love periods of submersion, um, they also can thrive in droughty type environments. Yeah, that's so obvious. Right? They don't require constant moisture. And so that's the key. They can tolerate it, they like it, but they don't require constant moisture. Yeah. 
So nice. Thank you so much. That's real good. We're just so glad to have y'all out here. Thanks for coming and visiting. And we're glad to be here. And if the folks are here locally, they can just stop by and oh, yeah. take a look, right? Gardens are open okay. um, every day of the week, sun up to sundown. All right. Thank you much. Come on out. All right. Nematodes are soil-born parasites that feed on plants and reduce their thriftiness. So if you plant an area with nematodes with, say, annual plants, they're just not going to reach their full potential and full, fill out and look really beautiful. We have struggled with nematodes in our parking lot island beds here at the UT Gardens Jackson for a number of years. Um, have done some things in the past to try to reduce those population numbers um, unsuccessfully. So this year we're taking a different approach. We've removed all of the plants, mulched the area, and we're just going to use this kind of shady spot as a display area for some of our um, pots that we're growing that have plants that are going through container trials um, and see if we can uh, lower those nematode population numbers uh, just by not having any plants that they can feed on. And then there are also some plants that uh, nematodes are discouraged from eating, it's like marigolds. If you have an area that you know you've got higher nematode populations, you could try planting uh, marigolds and they don't prefer to feed on those plants so in turn without a host plant to feed on you could technically lower population density. All right Booker let's talk about the correct way to cut your lawn because we don't okay. want to cut it too low right? Right. With the correct height. So right. how do we go about doing that? Chris normally we got two types of warm in grass but moody grass and zoya grass. Okay. You got cool season grass, fescue, you got some blue grass, we have blue grass also too. Right. Those are cool season grass in there. For your warm season grass, like your Zoya and Bermuda grass, it want to be somewhere between two and a half inch tall. Okay. For your blue season, uh, cool season grass, like blue grass, about three inches tall. Okay. Now, what, what you do, Chris, you, you can come over here and, and, and adjust your lawnmower right here. Now, see these out right here, these here, they would adjust your lawnmower right okay. there. And what you can do, you can get your ruler, put it on the ground right here up to where you want to mow it be at, on a level, level surface. Okay. You want to get it two and a half inches tall or three inches tall, depending on what grass you cut in there. Right. And the day I low my lawnmower blade real low, the cutter spot just shows what it looked like if you cut it too low. Okay. And how that grass can be damaged like that, you know, and cause problems in that zone. I want to cut it real okay. low this time. You right. watch how I look and see the difference in, okay? Okay, I will. Oh, wow. Oh, see that? Definitely skipped it, huh? Skipped it. Look at that. Yeah. Can you see the difference between the height and the real low there? You sure can. Hey, big difference in there. So you don't yeah. want to skip the grass. I almost see the roof right now. You sure can. If sun hit that, it can, it can kill that grass. Okay. You can have a lot of brown spots in your lawn, and you wonder why. Why my grass look brown like that? <laughs> the roots of the sun right on it. Right. Right there on it there. So you keep it at the right height, then it's kind of shading out a little bit. Okay. But take that grass in there. And I'll tell you something else too. When you scalp your yard like that, it makes that lawn thin. The weeds can actually outcompete <laughs> yeah, your grasses. Right. right. Cause right. sun, they like right. sun too. That's right. And they, they see them weeds, they start sprouting. They just start up. popping up. And then do that. So let's say you're out there cutting your yard, right? Okay. And you have maybe a little bump or a stump used to be there, or mm -hmm. the ground's depressed for whatever reason, and you're scapping it. How would you repair that scapping? That, that, that happened that a lot. That happened a lot of time. Yeah. You had a tree there or something like that. And the roots of me then, and that ground might be low right it's there. Low. You cut it, you cut it at the right height, but time you get to, the, to that spot, yeah, just it, it, it mowed drop down and 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 and, and caught it to be brown. Right. What you need to do probably get some more topsoil or something spread over that area, okay. some little sand, and try to level that area up or something. Because if you keep scabbing that over period over and over again, eventually that grass gonna die there. Right. So you want to get some come some topsoil and try to build that area up. Okay. In there, but because you don't want to keep scapping it like that every time. Right, because eventually the grass will grow up through it. It will go know, back through that, yeah, to yeah. catch on through that and everything. Yeah. But, but don't, don't, don't adjust your mow for that, that could be fish the spot. Right, right. And, and like you said, your mow is already at the right, right height. Yeah, 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 just a little depression yeah, yeah. or something, you know, stump, mm -hmm. you know, rotted and whatever the case may be. And another thing, when you, when you get the mow to the right height, okay. a lot of times I just like to cut my grass in different directions. Okay. You want to cut it this way this time, Next time, cut it this way here, just like I put the like fill down, okay. different direction. So, so why the different directions, though? One of the things that you want that grass to stand up. Right. Okay. You know, when, when I first started doing that, it was hard to go against the grain. Because <laughs> normally you'll grab that land, you cut it one way. Right. I, you get the lawnmower out of the garage, and just start cutting. Right. I did that for years and years. I've done that. I then now, now I cut my grass, I cut it any way I want to. Right. Because the grass is standing straight up. Okay. That means good for the water can get down to the root system. The fertilizer can get down to the root system and not no runoff. 
if your grass laying one way, they will hit that grass and it run off. Right. It's not getting down to the system. So this time, try cutting your grass in a different direction. You will see a big difference in that grass then. Okay. And, and, and you can do that whether it's a warm season grass or cool season grass. Season grass, yeah. Okay. Another thing that had that blade sharp. Oh yes, sir. Had that blade right. sharp now. Normally, I try my blade twice during the growing season. Okay. To make sure I got a good clean cut. That's right. That's right. And there, so that grass stand up. You want that grass to stand up. Let's go back to the to the blade for a second. You always used to tell us what. Make sure you know how to take it off, right? <laughs> yeah, make sure. Right. I did that and one time. On that I did that one time. I took the blade off. Right. And, and for guys, how did the blade come off the <laughs> this way or that way? I mark my blade now. If I know how I go back under there. Okay. I take it off. Take the one the hard way to get it sharp. And then put it back on there. Okay. Good. You know, and and, and, and it, it, you you see a different cut. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. So if you have this grass here, can you go back over that, or can you bag that, or how would you do that? No, you you, you wait for a long time. You might want to bag that or run back across there. Okay. Now, the, 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 the much and more, yeah. that grass is really good for your lawn. Right. It do add a little nitrogen to the soil. That's right. If you got a little, you got a little kiss on there, but it play on it, be, make it kind of look soft a little bit. Okay. A lot of folks thought a long time ago that add thatch to your lawn, but that grass will rot and decay in good organic material. Okay. Good organic okay. material in there. In there. And one yeah. last thing I want to ask, so is it a certain type of lawnmower that you like to use more than the other or what? Does well, I, would just, I, I got a, a much and more, and I also okay. got a bag on there too. Okay. I can bag that grass if I need to, and I can mush it in there. And when I say I have a bag that grass, if you got any kind of disease on your lawn, any kind of fungus on that grass, you want to bag that. Okay. You don't want to just leave it on that. You don't want to leave those clippings on your lawn. Right. You want to bag that and put it somewhere to dispose of that grass. Okay. You don't want to use it in your compost pile. Right. You don't right. want to cause you don't want that disease in, in, in whatever you put it around. Yeah. Because yeah. they okay. stay on there. Okay. You got dead grass, disease grass, bag it. Bag it. Bag it. Yeah. Throw it away. Throw it away. <laughs> okay. Uh, another question would be this. So, I mean, when do you like to cut your, your yard? I mean, well, do you wait till the dew dries off or you know, what I, if it just got through raining or, you know? <laughs> I think that's a cool question because a lot of time okay. I see people cutting their grass when they're wet and that is not good for the grass. Okay. And really not good for your lawnmower either. Because when that grass wet, that mow taking, it's taking more power to cut that grass. Right. Because then you got a much more, it's not going to be mushed up real good. You got a bag on there, it's not throwing it back to the bag. Yeah. Your grass is not, it's not going to look good when you cut it when it's wet. I like for my grass to dry off. You know, if I can cut it in the evening time, when, you know, in the evening time, it'll be fine. As long as I can put no water on it, it'll be, <laughs> be a good time to do that. Uh -huh. But you want to make sure that grass dry, and you don't want to cut it when it's wet. Right. Because you look on your lawn with all that grass and get up under there. You're really, you're really killing your lawn more life. Right. Because you're pulling it harder. And not doing anything, not cutting the grass good, and it's not, it not gonna look good. Right, mm -hmm. right. And plus, like you said, you'd be choking the lawnmower out. Taking the lawnmower out, yeah. Right, right. Because mm -hmm. that grass, you know, it's a big clump of grass. Big clump of grass, and wet. It's not wet, it's not cutting. It rolls up into balls sometimes, mm -hmm. so it could be real difficult. And I see that folks way. doing that sometimes, too. It's it, it, it not, it not good. It's not, it not good on your lawnmower, and it's not good for your grass. Right. Usually mm -hmm. when I see it, they not cutting it at the right height, and then they're cutting it when it's wet. So it's wet, a double yeah. whammy. <laughs> double whammy to that, right. everything in there. Then you cutting it when it's wet. Your blade can do it a faster too. Okay. Yeah, you can so you need to make sure you do it right. All right. Thank you for that information, Booker. Appreciate that. Enjoy it, right. man. Thank yeah. you much. So we are in the garden and we're looking at this tomato plant. I think we may have possible tomato hornworm damage. As you can see here, the leaves have been eaten off. And something else you can do, you can actually look for the fecal material. And guess what? There's some right there. It lets me know a tomato hornworm is near. And there it is, the tomato hornworm. As you can see, the horn, hence the name tomato hornworm. I've been doing a lot of damage here. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to get out the sprayer. Uh, it has BT product in it. Uh, javelin, a uh, dipel is what you can use. Again, the active ingredient is BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, make sure that you spray your tomato plant, get good coverage. And what happens is the tomato hornworm is gonna eat the foliage. Once he eats the foliage, it's gonna give him a stomach ache and he's gonna die. All right, this is our Q&A segment. You ready? I'm ready. All these right. are great questions. Here's our first viewer email. I have quite a number of these orange amaryllis, which used to all burst into bloom about Easter. This year, only a few flowered. I have plenty of foliage which looks healthy. Every so often, I would trim them because they multiply so enthusiastically. I like that. I have never given them any special attention, and they have been reliable bloomers for decades. I leave them in the ground year-round, and this has never seemed to bother them. Mm. We don't have a real winter here. Why don't they bloom as they once did? Oh. Thank you. Happy gardening. This is Brenda from Orlando. Oh, 
Florida. So Celeste, you're up on this one. So oh, yeah. they were doing so fine. They were doing so well. No care. All of a sudden they're not right. blooming. And now so, they're just not doing well. They're well, not doing well at all. You know, I know that she mentioned that she has thinned in the past. So I mean, okay. that is, you know, a potential. Right. They may just need to, uh, to have some more space so okay. each of those bulbs can grow individually. Um, but also I would want, I would ask her to um, look at the shade in that area, right? Okay. So Good. she said they've been there for years mm -hmm. and years. If mm -hmm. she's got trees or large shrubs in that area, they've been growing as well right. over this period of years. So maybe they're getting more shade than they used to, and so maybe that's uh, affecting their uh, their bloom quality I could or go the with number that. of she blooms could. possibly. You know, I have a thought. They have to yeah. have a dormant period, and I wonder if something's changed about the water flow. Because okay. for us, we have to force them to go dormant. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if she's being in Florida, it doesn't yeah. get cool. Um, I wonder if something's changed about the water or maybe too much nitrogen. Possibly. Something's changed. Right. Could be too much water. Okay. All right. Nitrogen. Yeah, it could be an issue as well. Crowding. You know, mm -hmm. could be an issue. Now, how about nutrients? Do they have enough nutrients during the post-blooming period? So that's something else yes. I thought about. Yeah. You know, to kind of well. regenerate. Yeah, to their, regenerate it. Yes. All right. So, um, like, make sure you know that you're leaving the foliage because the foliage mm -hmm. is going to be a Good. natural generator of energy, and she's been doing this for years, so I'm yep. sure that she's aware of that. But for the other viewers who might be right. listening sure. to us today, uh, make sure that they're leaving that um, that foliage and letting yeah. it, you know, do photosynthesis and and refuel that bulb for mm -hmm. the next season's bloom. Yeah. So just keeping them thinned and monitoring the the light okay. and and just an eye keep an eye on anything that's changed anything that's what you're changed. that's what we're trying to to identify here so evaluate all the options all right sounds good thank you miss brenda thank you for that question all right here's our next viewer email what is this on my tupelo tree and what can i do about it when we put the tree in 22 years ago it was about eight feet tall today it is 27 feet tall and seems to be healthy except for this occurring in June, the last few years. This is Mary from West Warwick, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. All right, yes. so how about the Hertupolo tree? We know what that is, don't we? So yes. what you tell I the was folks? so excited when I saw that picture. I was like, <laughs> oh, I know excited. what this is. I don't even have to do any research. <laughs> so those are called um, bladder galls, mm -hmm. and they're exactly. caused by an area mite. Mm -hmm. They're they're very very small you're not going to be able to see right. these mites with your, your with your naked naked eye so um there is not a lot that we can do as far as control goes but know that this problem is aesthetic and it's not really um hurting you know the live right. livelihood of that tree so um if you can if you can tolerate it just live with it really because it's not it's not causing any adverse effects so no health on the tree whatsoever mm -mm. Cool. and as those mites and it's a little confusing there's tons of different kinds oh, of aerified yeah. mites tons. and they they can cause lots of different types of galls like different gall shapes right, right. so we've got bladder galls we have horn galls um, and the list goes on target spot galls just all different types so if you see something strange mm -hmm. um, happening on a leaf that you've never seen before um, you know delve in and do a little research on that you may just be dealing with a uh, a certain type of verified mite gall. It might just be, right? Yeah. So mites can cause that. Also parasitic wasp. Oh, yes. Or you know, something else that can cause those galls. So, uh, yeah, they're just unique. I like the way they look. They're, they're not too bad. They're weird. And, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're weird. weird. And also on those tupelos, in addition to the bladder galls, they can also, there's a separate mite that causes um, the edges to crinkle, and mm. I think they call them like a crinkle leaf gall or something yeah, like that. that. Mm -hmm. So, like, those are just a few things that you might see okay. on, on tupelos. All right, so thank you for the question, Miss Mary. Appreciate that. All right. Don't worry about it. It'll be just fine. All right, here's our next viewer email. I love Calibrecoa. Mm, I've got I some new too. plants from the garden center this spring. Within a few days after getting them home, something was eating them in my petunias. The blooms and leaves are damaged, but the plant is not dying. I see no larvae or eggs on the plants, but mm. there is a shiny residue like slug slime. What could it be and how can I treat it? And this is Kelly from Bartlett, Tennessee. So, you know, we had a wet spring. It's dry now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we had a lot she of rain did. in spring she and did. early summer, which causes slugs and snails yes, to be worse. So yes. I have a feeling that's what it could be. I and they're do. feeding at nighttime. You're not out in the daytime. Oh, you're not, not seeing them, them, not them out in the daytime. And caliber koi particularly is prone to, I've, I've found here, okay. uh, to snail issues. So also, okay. if it happens to be in a little bit of a shadier situation, you know, I know caliber is a sun plant, but you might yeah. have it where it gets some shade. They'll be worse in that, that situation. Right. 
Uh, but it could also be, you mentioned earlier. Oh, right. Well, you know, when she mentioned the, the shiny, shiny substance, rock. I was just thinking, you know, uh, feeding from soft bodied insects uh, like aphids, um, white flies, things like mm -hmm. that. As mm -hmm. they feed, they'll excrete honeydew. Sure and it could even be setting below something, dropping the it honeydew. Right? Yeah, Good point. Maybe be. they're crate feeding yeah, on yeah, a crepe myrtle, myrtle right. and that's the right. pot's underneath that's right. the crepe myrtle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yep. uh, that's a possibility. It I know sure I didn't, is. eventually that honeydew, um, in most cases, will develop black sooty mold mm -hmm. on it. But and in the picture, I didn't see any of that. I didn't that. see any but, either. Um, just that was kind so of a So slugs, tip. snails probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Oh, and then she said, "How to what? What are some tips for controlling yeah, those? I, I've never really right. had issues with slugs. Well, I've never I do dealt with at that home personally. as well as here occasionally. Uh, you know, if they're in pots, oftentimes they'll go under the pot at nighttime okay. or in the evening, or in, I'm sorry, in the daytime when they're yeah, you know they so look hot. for yeah. hiding places. So right. eliminate hiding places. There are slug bait, slug slug baits out there. Just be careful if you've got pets. Be sure and use some that yeah. are there are some out there that are safe yes. for pets. So be sure and, and monitor yeah, for that. Yeah, iron phosphate is the active ingredient. You know, for those that are safe for pets, iron phosphate. Got Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I didn't um, know that. And then, of course, you can also pick them off. You know, go out with a flashlight. Yeah. It's amazing what you can see <laughs> at night with a flashlight. Um, and, and or a black light. <laughs> yeah, or a black light. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Think about that. Yeah. Yes. Like, how about that? Yeah, you just have to know the environments that the snails and slugs like, right? Yes. Damp, wet, you know, things like that. All right. So there you go, Kelly. Thank you for that question. We appreciate that. All right. That was fun. Thank y'all so much. Thanks. Those are great questions. Yeah, it was fun. I had a good time. Thank you much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. If you want more information on hydrangeas, lawn care, or anything else we talked about today, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. Be sure to join us next week for the family plot, gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.